Hello and welcome to the Guna Talk. Back again with you guys for another episode of our tactical breakdown series, specifically looking at our players out on loan this season. As always, at the start of our shows, I'm joined very happily by Ben from the Marseille View. How are you doing, mate? You good? You well? Good, good. Well, um, keeping an eye on the loanies over in France. Um, it's not been as good a month as the last time we did the show when when Balogun scored four goals in three weeks, I think. But still, mm. they've still had a decent month. So, looking forward to debriefing. Absolutely. We'll kick off with with Balogun because um, he is the, the guy kind of every Arsenal fan is talking about. <coughs> Obviously, the difference between now and, and the end of February we talked about is the closure of the January window. Arsenal decided not to recall Balogun. Mm-hmm. And he's continued to score. He's given you know Arsenal fans plenty of reasons to, to discuss maybe was that uh, a mistake, especially with Nketiah's recent injury and Gabriel Jesus being out. But how has February and the start of March been for, for Balogun? Um, quieter than, than January. Um, I think he, he got himself to the top of the league scoring board, didn't he, in um, in January? But um, he's, he's had a, a less prolific month in in terms of goals, but his stats have improved certainly on the defensive side. Um, and I think we, we mentioned last time the coach there, Will Steele, getting all the plaudits. So he's half, half mm. English, half Belgian, I believe. So he, he's taken a liking to Balogun. He's given more specific coaching. Um, I think he's had a little niggling um, calf problem yeah. that, that hasn't stopped him playing, but uh, may have affected his his sort of desirability to sprint. But um, he's still been performing very well um, by all, for all intents and purposes. Um, it's, it's a case of, you know, Haas, I think they currently have the longest unbeaten um, run in Europe. I think they're 18 or 19 goals and, uh, games unbeaten. So um, to be part of that as, as a young player especially knowing when you've got a parent club that that's, has extra expectations and stuff, it can only be predict, um, only be helpful, right, mentally to, to have that experience if you are to come back to a bigger club and go, I was part of a team that didn't lose. Yeah, the last game they lost in Liga was in September. Like that's it's before the mental. World Cup. Yeah. yeah that's, that's crazy. I, I, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, they've lost... Uh, in the in the Coupe de France, they lost yeah. to Toulouse. I mean, how they lost to Toulouse? <laughs> oh, <laughs> I don't shocking. Know. shocking. Um, yeah, it's a shame they weren't able to progress past uh, past them. But yeah, they, they've not lost since September, and they've obviously been a side that have had their fair, fair share of associations with red cards uh, as yeah. well uh, throughout the season as well, both for them and and the opposition side. But yeah, the, the since we've done that last show, uh, he scored in a four 0 win over Troyes, uh, but did blank against Nice to lose uh, again. Them cropping up uh, Anna Jazio, who I always pronounce incorrect incorrectly. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, I, I mean. Sure one of your worst ones, Tom. To be fair, yeah, it's the one of the worst ones I have. It is it's the one not, of the it's worst. not, it's I not, it's not. Right. <laughs> Hulse, Hulse is your worst one, yeah, very true, very true. Um, but in, in regards to kind of the rest of the season and what Arsenal are doing, a lot of Arsenal fans, I know that you have obviously an appreciation for Arsenal as well, so you can speak mm. for that side. But in the summer, a lot of people were saying, like, we should be making a decision between Nketia and Balogun. And Nketia is the one that I'd say probably the majority of supporters at the moment feel as though should be kind of look to move on and we should look to integrate Balogun into the team. But what do you make of the idea of having three strikers? Because at the moment, Arsenal are without two of their natural ones in Jesus and Nketiah both out. And it makes you think with, in hindsight, well, maybe recalling Balogun or having three strikers next season is the right choice. But you, you've got to go from the principle that you're, the ambition for Arsenal will be to play on all three tables and, and it's looking more and more certain now that the European table will be the Champions League, right? So yeah. um, it's, I think it, it's it's between a, a, a rock and a hard place. You've got to to analyse it as a whole and take a step back and, and look at the context and go, I, I get people being frustrated with Enketia. I've been frustrated watching some of the games, um, but you, you know what you've got, but you don't know what you're getting back, if that makes sense. So Balogun, for all it, you know, Credit to him. He's smashed it in Liga. Uh, he's been the main striker. He's started every game. He's built up confidence. He's bagged in the goals. And he's part of a team with a system that, that is designed to play to his strengths. Now, yes, you, you'd all like to see a, you know, Hayland product, Academy product do well and come back to the club and be a success story. But you, I'd, I'd still be, be cautious of applying that buffer, which is, you know, the French league back to... Um, if, he'd, if it was like Sadi Ban, he'd come to Marseille and he'd played the European Cup and he'd, he'd, he'd had a solid season and um, he, he was already sort of seasoned pro with, with quite a few senior games in the top leagues 
under his belt, it's a different story because he's played in a club with pressure and expectation. Here, um, he's got the talent, he's got the ball skills, the mental strength, I'm sure, as, as mentioned earlier, he's building up. The, the, the question mark is how big is that how big is is that gap between the Premier League and Liga? And how big is that gap between um having to, to, to play that sort of in great and catcher role where you're probably only going to get 10 or 20 minutes a game and then some cup games if you're lucky. And that is if you are the second striker, let alone the third striker. Yeah. Um, I think it's just, it's very difficult. And and if you, it would make sense on paper, I agree with you to have three strikers, but you, I, if I'm Balogun, I'm not accepting that. I'm like, mate, I smashed it last season. Um, for my development and, and my own career path, I need to be playing. I need to be playing regularly and um, at least as regularly as, as, as Enketia has this season. But still, um, if I was him, his his um, profile is going to be massively boosted on the market. You, you'd anticipate that like any returning low need to the parent club and, and contract talks and all of that, he'll probably want a bigger wage as well. So there's all of that to take into consideration. Is he going to be happy playing second or third fiddle? Are the club going to want to do that? Are there going to be offers for Enketia? Because it's all well and good wanting to move him on, but is anybody going to want him with his wages? Um, I think you've got to be very, very cautious. Yeah, very cautious indeed. Um, and it's uh, arguably his value at Arsenal might be at its peak come the end yes. of this season. And we don't, and, and selling him might be be able to get Arsenal the best fee they they ever could get for him. I still get flashbacks to Ainsley Maitland-Niles uh, and not accepting that £20 million Wolves bid. So, yes, it's it's something that Arsenal will have to weigh up considerably in the summer. Um, let's talk about your own team then, and Marseille and, and Nuno Tavares. It's not been the best of months, it might be fair to say. No, it's good, it's a good thing you, you mentioned I, I can't swear too much because um, <laughs> I was going to go on a rant. But um, he... It's what I was telling you before the show. He, he He's very frustrating because he can have... Last month we were chatting and, and I think I was telling you, yeah, he scored three goals in the last six games and he's found his footing and, and the, the two games that he was put to right wing back, that was a tactical decision to, to cut in on his left foot, worked. Um, and then since then, I think he, he had um, a couple of weeks out. Um, yeah, I think this is the last time we discussed it, just been confirmed he was going to miss the, the PSG Cup game that we, we won for a change um and then lost to the amateur team on, on Wednesday in the next round but that's a different story but actually he was he was in that game so he was out for 10 days then he came back and since he's come back from injury he's been dreadful um it, and it's just frustrating he he's often you see a lot of him because of his activity his work rate he gets himself up and down that wing no problem at all but he just lacks that 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 brain that end product um it's a couple of notable examples. Sunday, we, we played PSG in the league at home and we, we absolutely bullied them. And he didn't play in that cap game, but we bullied them for the first time in 10 years. We were we were equal to them. We, we kicked Neymar and Messi up and down the pitch. We, we won 2-1, absolutely dominated them. But on Sunday, for some... Again, he can't take all of the flak here, but he was deployed at right wing back from the start of the game to, to contain Mbappé with, uh, with, with Eric Bailly, Manchester United, Loney, who, who's come back from suspension um, and, it, and it, he was it just didn't work it backfired and, and don't get me wrong you, you wouldn't find, you wouldn't wish defending against Mbappe on anybody um, but it's even more even more dangerous when, when you're Nuno Tavares and you already have those weaknesses that mean you could probably keep up with him in a fat race but if he starts cutting inside there's no way you can read what he's going to do because you just don't have that experience or or that that football IQ yet. So, but but we started the game brightly, and he actually had our two clearest chances of the game. He he got through, played through one on one with uh, with Donnarumma, and then he, he just had a brain fart and mm. just took three two three seconds on the ball instead of shooting, and then and the defender caught up to him, put it out for a corner. But we were, I think, everybody at that moment was shouting shoot shoot shoot, and he just lost concentration. And then um, Wednesday night. <sighs> We, we played uh, Ansi, who were what, second from bottom in, in the equivalent of the championship in France. And he um, he was a bit, bit terrible too. Didn't have a good game at all against amateur team, right? And then, to cap things off, he missed one of, um, one, of the, one, of the, one of our penalties in the shootout, which cost us qualification. So I think people are being a bit too harsh with him in terms of Marseille fans. And, and you know, we're very passionate and sometimes downright stupid, like every fan base. And Arsenal have got this as well. You overcritical... Uh, you know, one loss or one bad performance and, and, and all of the good works put into question. But 
um, he's he, he's not making any friends because he's it's just that sort of nonchalant lack of just consistency that is really frustrating everyone. And I guess it's it's very frustrating because it feels like one step forward, two step backwards with him every couple of months. And I think it is a concentration thing. He's got the athletic qualities, but um, again, as we've, we've said. Every every show I think we've done about Tavares is his his mental coaching, his his concentration, um, and his his just overall um, lucidity when he gets into that final third, playing the right ball at the right time. That's what he's he's lacking, even when he's on form. Um, and I think it's it's difficult because he I think he is getting a bit of scapegoated because you know I think Marseille fans are very frustrated because we've knocked PSG and Rennes out the cup. We were all thinking this is it, we're going to win a trophy this year. And then we, we get humbled at home by by a second division team, and the two players who got the, the penalty, who missed the penalties in the shootout, are getting shitloads of abuse. Excuse me, excuse my French again. But um, <laughs> oh, you nearly went the whole one. I part, nearly so did. Well. Um, but but yeah, that was it. Um, but no, it's, it's it's mixed emotions for for Tavares, and just it, it came out in the press actually today that um, apparently we're, we're we're considering not not carrying on with him this summer and, and leaving him back to Arsenal instead of either extending his loan or making an offer. So quite interesting development, um, especially after recent events. It could just be press rumours, but um, it does feel increasingly like there's no no future for him at Marseille. Mad. I mean, every time we talk about Tavares, we end up talking about like the summer and the future and what Arsenal mm. will do. It seems, I mean, there was rumours that uh, L'Equipe, I think, re- reported something uh, this month about Arteta not being particularly happy with his behaviour uh, last season in training. Um, and that's one of the big reasons why they were so open to seeing him leave on loan. So many Arsenal fans think that Arsenal are going to get upwards of 20 million of <laughs> Tavares. And I'm just like, we'll be lucky to get 15, guys. Like, we'll be lucky to get 15 yeah, it's, million. And it's I not think a bad return on investment. So you paid it's six a double of the investment. Yeah. So... I, yeah, I, I, the, the warped idea around player value. I did a piece today about Kieran Tierney's valuation. I did a piece on why his starting price is is about thirty million pounds at the moment, having barely played, having had numerous injury issues. The British tax. So, uh, yeah, of course, but I mean, he's not homegrown, um, which oh. is because Scotland doesn't count. Um, but uh, yeah, arguably that that Premier League experience mm. does just put him in good stead. But Tavares, I'm not sure. He's a player that I could see if he fits in the right team somewhere, maybe in Italy, Atalanta, for instance, yes. were interested last season. Maybe that would be the right place for him. We'd have to see what he's worth. Uh, now the chat box is trying to wind me up. I can see him trying there, artist. Um, <laughs> let's round off our uh, our Liga chat with Nicola Pepe, um, who is always kind of the. Uh, the wild cards, uh, because Arsenal, you know, have invested in January in another wide player in Leandro Trossard coming into the team. And uh, Pepe is a player that we all want um, to do well, but he's not been in the squad for Nice. What, what's kind of happened? Do you know? Um, he, he picked up a bit of an injury and then he's... Um, it's not, victim is not the right word, but Nice have been one of the top performing teams in the last couple of months in Ligue 1. Um, they, they've taken mm. points. They, they beat us at home. They took, uh, they beat their, their neighbours Monaco away 3 0 um, 10 days ago. So I, I think it's, uh, you know, he's a bit of a victim of circumstance, really. It's, um, he, he went out, he got injured and, and went out of the 11 at the worst possible time, and, and his replacements have, have come in and, uh, and done well. And so he's going to, I think he, was, he may struggle if they maintain current form to find his way back into starting 11 when he does come back. Um, I'm not sure. I think he's only out for another week or two, max. But um, he, he he played the game, I think, at the start of February, and then he's he's missed all of them since the second week of February, I think. Yeah, um, the last game he played was the 15th of January. Was it January? Okay. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So he has been out injured. Well, that explains why they beat Marseille. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess... Um, he, he's been good, as we mentioned last time. You know, he was starting to find form after the World Cup. He, his form has been resurgent. But again, mm. it's he did, he did have a bit of a similar injury record with Arsenal, didn't he? Where he, he, yeah. he would he would go on a bit of a run of, of a good three or four games and then he'd, he'd pick up an injury and be sidelined for a few weeks. Um, but I think it's... Yeah, it's going to be difficult. Nice, nice have got a new coach. He's found the system. Um 
Pepe was doing well in that system up until his injury. And, and as we know, it's, it's always a challenge to get back in the team. Absolutely. Um, I'm looking at uh, the Nice team now. Is it Buanani? Uh, he's the yeah. young guy, 18 year old, um, well, that's been playing. He's done, well. um, he's done well. Yeah, at the moment, I'm just looking at how he's got on. He's got uh, three assists in, in the games that Pepe's been absent for, which yeah. is three times as many as Pepe got. He hasn't scored yet, um, but as an 18 year old, you know, you look at Nice and you'd be like, well, we got this guy on loan, or we've got this young talent who we could invest time into that's starting for us. It's going to be difficult to see Pepe getting too many minutes between now and the season. Yeah, I get, well, I think he may get minutes, but um, because they're, st they're still Start. in Europe, they're still yeah. in the Conference League. But um, yeah, it all depends what Pepe comes, but which Pepe comes back from injury, Tom. <laughs> Let's see. They have Sheriff uh, in the uh, yep. Conference League. Who are the? I believe are they the team that beat Real Madrid? They um, did, yeah, last year. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that. The and and I mean, this is the thing. I mean, uh, French football fans and, and press like to like to piss all over Marseille because we don't qualify often from our Champions League groups and stuff. But when yeah. we're every every second season we go on a run. I mean, last year we went to semi-finals of the, the Conference League, and and this year uh, many of the French teams you could argue, apart from Nantes, who drew Juventus, mm. um, Monaco had Leverkusen, um, Rennes had a really poor team as well. And they all got knocked out in in the um in the uh, how do you call it the the playoff stage. The playoffs, yes. So so Nice are the only ones because they topped their group in the Conference League. They 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 dodged the playoffs, but again, it just goes to show. I mean, yeah, they, French teams and and French football entirely doesn't seem to take anything below Champions League seriously, and it just it just reflects on the on the performances in these types of competitions, and and they 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 do rotate. And they do, but they do also start the, the starting eleven sometimes. But yeah. based on that record of the other teams, I wouldn't be too confident that Nice take it more seriously and go further. Um, and and that means probably even less time for Pepe. Um, and and you know, it's, again, it's as you said, if you're Nice and you have a young academy product who's producing and, and, and turning up every week and taking his place, then his Pepe's wages are already a huge challenge for any club that, that would consider taking him away from Arsenal, let alone the potential transfer fee. So I don't think he's going to stay in, in Nice, that's for sure. Yeah, the wages as well. I mean, Nice have covered, I think, uh, 25%. Uh, I think they've covered something like 25%. And then he waived 25% of his wages. And yeah. Arsenal, I think, are paying uh, the rest of them. So, yeah, 50%. So it's, <laughs> it, it's a really messy situation for Edu and Arsenal to work at in the summer. Um, my prediction is he'll probably again go on loan for the final month, so. final year, and yeah. then just have his contract terminated. I think that's probably what will happen. I mean, what um, what, what clubs have been doing is they um, we we've done it with a player, um, Radonich. No, with Radonich, we um, when they have a year left, there's this this thing where you make it a pay, you know, paying loan. So, for example, you charge the team ten or fifteen million to to basically sign him. But he goes on loan, and then they they pay the fee at the end of the season, so that they it yeah. goes into their next next yeah, financial year. That happened year. with Gendouzi. I'm sure that did. I'm swear. Uh, that pretty, yeah, pretty, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, but it's it's an obligation to buy, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So they, they, that's yeah, what teams tend to do. Not so many uh, appearances. Uh, exactly, but it's different. It's different in the case when he's he's his contract's running down, but. Yeah, they, Arsenal will, will. I'm sure in that in that instance, if they do loan him out for his final season, they they would include a fee like 10, 15 million, and, and just to recoup some of the money. Really, mm. got no choice. No, tricky one. Uh, well, hopefully uh, he turns things around because Arsenal are going to need him to if they're going to try and get anything from him in the, in the summer. I feel like I end our Pepe section with that every single time, but it's just <laughs> the way that we start with him. Uh, ben, thank you so much for joining Pleasure, me. As, as always. always, tell people they can find you. Yeah, the Marseille view. Um, actually, a, a few of us are going out to uh, to Marseille to witness the atrocities that Tavares commits on a football pitch this weekend. <laughs> um, and then again at the end of the month, uh, probably before before we record the next one of these. So uh, yeah, I'll be able to give you first hand feedback and impressions from the stadium <laughs> about Lovely Nuno Tavares. Um, hopefully, he improves. We'll see, uh, Ben. Thank you for your time, mate. As always, I'll speak to you soon. Pleasure. Take care, everyone. Absolutely. Lovely stuff. Massive thank you to Ben uh, for joining us, as always, in our first section of 
our loan roundup show. Next, we are going to move on to our brand new loanee, Marquinhos. They're very happy uh, that we've got some expert insight and we'll have expert insight for the rest of the season from the guys at the Canary cast. And very happy that Jacob has provided some insight. So let's hear what he's got to say about Marquinhos' debut and move from Arsenal, uh, which I can tell you was very impressive indeed. Hi Tom mate, hope you're well, hope all the Arsenal fans are well. Jacob here from Canary Cast talking about, here to talk about I should say, Marquinhos who to be fair has only been a a very quick and brief introduction we've seen of him but a very good one, Uh, just the one start, two games, we won't really talk about the middle one because he uh, recently because he came on for about five minutes when Norwich were completely under the cosh so it would be completely unfair to uh, talk about his appearance there but against Cardiff he played for 59 minutes and was really good on his debut Uh, played on the right wing scored a good goal nice little uh, cutback from Rodel Hernandez kind of slightly right hand side of the penalty area and lash it into the back of the net and an assist as well to be fair it was quite a simple pass to Gabriel Sara who smashed it into the bottom corner but to be fair to him his whole round game looked really good and he looked really bright so for Arsenal fans who maybe won't know about Norwich, so normally we have Kieran Dowell who's currently injured there on the on the right hand side of the pitch. He's probably more of a number ten playing right hand side. So again, left footed and would cut in. Marquinhos straight away looked a step above uh, Kieran Dowell. Let's to be perfectly honest, which I think a lot of Arsenal fans would expect. But Norwich fans have a <laughs> a common history with lone players maybe coming from big clubs um, and maybe not hitting the ground running all of the time. Billy Gilmore <laughs> being one of them, uh, Marcus Edwards as well from Spurs back in the day never really hitting the heights of what we wanted but Marquinhos looked really good um, got a very good touch used his body really well actually as well to be fair as a as a, a kind of a neutral to him I didn't I haven't really seen enough of him uh, not really even his obviously seen clips of his debut in the Europa League and things like that and seen kind of brief highlights from his, his time at Sao Paulo with our, our former Sao Paulo player as well Gabriel Sara um, seen kind of <clears throat> highlights of him and saying yeah he looks like a bright young prospect but the championship is obviously a different beast Cardiff a very traditional championship side very physical very much to the point of wanting to get their body in and, and tackle him hard and he dealt with that really well actually he put his body in perfectly when when, when the, the fullback was trying to tackle him and trying to hurt him he was using his body really effectively <clears throat> winning fouls but not diving not here there and everywhere and had a very good kind of level of strength to it which was really impressive his dribbling is excellent as well not the quickest but more than good enough in terms of his dribbling to uh, create serious problems in this league and I think a lot of home games for Norwich he'll either start the game and like I say take 50-60 minutes and, and really try and hurt, hurt the opposition or come on as, a, as, as an impact player I think either way he'll score goals and make assists for Norwich and he's a really exciting player going forward so hopefully more of the same like I say hopefully next time uh, when I talk to you guys it'll be a bit more of a detailed progression with him and he's played a few more games but as we've seen it starting off he's been excellent and uh, really looking forward to seeing what else he could offer one goal one assist so far and hopefully a lot more to come uh, we'll keep you updated canary cast for all things norwich and marquinhos and i'll we'll see you in the next one thanks guys see you later that's it thank you to jacob for helping us out with today's marquinhos roundup uh having a quick look at the stats as jacob mentioned one goal one assist so far uh for norwich and his debut only came on for like seven minutes in the other day so wasn't enough really to go on but he created 2.54 shot actions uh in the game which is great uh he's averaging that 79.2 percent pass accuracy 2.54 crosses as well and he's doing plenty in terms of his his direct dribbles uh, he's rather defensive duels uh per game eight point eight seven is really in uh, helping out defensively as well uh, fouls clearances interceptions defensively showing up quite good yes actually needs to add a few clearances to his game but uh, interceptions and defensive duels coming out really strong there all right let's go to Sambi Laconga and to do that we're going to get help from D from the back of the nest podcast let's hear what he's got to say about what is whilst maybe not the best form for Palace certainly some really good performances from our young Belgian midfielder What's going on, people? It's the from back of the nest here for the Conga update. And trust me, you're going to want to hear about this because I think he surprised a lot of Arsenal fans as well as Palace fans as well. He started the last three games against the likes of Brentford, Liverpool and Aston Villa. And in those three games, we've had our best performances since 2022. Um, look, he's been fantastic for us. Even though we haven't won them games, I think what he's helped us with the most is the fact that He's solid on the ball, very good player on the ball. And, you know, his passing has been exceptional for us. And 
um, and has helped us out massively in midfield because we've been crying out for a midfielder all season long. He's been playing as a number six, kind of. Not a pure number six by himself, but he's been next to the Corey as a holding midfielder. And I feel like they've both helped each other off. I mean... With Decore, he's better defensively than Lukonga, but Lukonga is also more comfortable on the ball. He's been press resistant as well. And he's smart. He's got an IQ. I don't think he's as bad as the player that some of the Arsenal fans have made him out to be. I think his defensive game, especially even in the last three games I started when we've had these positive performances, is been not as bad as I expected when he did first join. I'm already seeing improvements. He's made some appearances coming off the bench as well against the likes of Manchester United when he did join. But you know, for for example, the Liverpool game, when he started that game, he was tracking back at times and helping out defensively, um, picking up the Liverpool runners. That was positive. I think that was the main concern, one of the main concerns with Lukonga joining us. So I think whilst he's going to be at Palace, his game is going to improve. But in the short term, he has 100% helped us and it is looking positive so far. I'm not reach that level yet of saying look on go I'm willing to spend 35 to 40 million pounds which I've seen some Arsenal fans uh message me about I don't think he's reached that levels of um excellence yet but what he does best is the basics and sometimes you just need to start somewhere and that's helped us out a player that's comfortable on the ball a player a player that's willing to learn a player that doesn't have all the world's expectations on him at Palace I think it's gonna help him in the long run and hopefully this is only the start. He started three games. I'm expecting him to start way more games. Of course, he's not going to start against you lot, which is going to be unfortunate. Um, but yeah, I think he's going to improve as a player. And I've been very, very, very happy with what I've seen from him so far. And it's been massive to our performances, despite us not getting wins. But look, thanks for having me on and all the best for the rest of the season, apart from when we face you in a few weeks' time. Appreciation to D as always. Lively chap, isn't he? Uh, he's great for this sort of thing, and D will continue to provide us, provide us rather, with updates on Lakonga for the rest of the season. Not scored or assisted so far. Not necessarily created too many shot creating actions, but uh, a really good pass accuracy: ninety point three percent, four point four three defensive duels per ninety, and three point four one interceptions per ninety as well. He's certainly improving and progressing. Right, we're going to move on to Brooke Norton Cuffey now for our next uh, expertise. And this one comes from a brand new piece of expertise. Reese, I'm back again, sorry. Reese from uh, Sky Blue uh, Fan TV is giving us an update on Norton Cuffey. So let's hear what he's got to say on our right wing back currently on loan at Covent. Hi guys, it's Reese from uh, Sky Blue Fans TV. Just here to talk about uh, Brooke Norton Cuffey, who's on loan from Arsenal. Um yeah, good pretty pretty good player from what I've seen. He's um quite physical. He gets um his main attribute is getting forward, he's direct. I think he's built for the championship as well. He's he's quite physical and quite big for his age, only nineteen years of age. He um his crossing he's quite his crossing's pretty good. Um he knows how to put a good ball in. He's um defensively well he he was at Rotherham the first half of the season and sort of the, the SP we got from the Rotherham fans that defensively he's, he's a little bit weak. But to be honest, he's come up against some really good players in the championship um, and he's held his own. I think um, he's comfortable on the ball. Um, he never seems to be in full flight, if that makes sense. So when he's attacking, he always seems to be, you know, in second or third gear. But um, yeah, he's he's settled in quite well. He seems to be liked by a lot of the players. And... Um, yeah, it'd be interesting to see what, what he can bring between now and the end of the season. But so far, so good, I would say. Like I say, he's only 19, so he's still got a lot, a lot in the, uh, in the locker to learn. But yeah, overall, I think, uh, he'll be, he'll be a good player between now and the end of the season. Like I say, I think defensively, he's been pretty solid. Uh, but his main attribute is getting forward. He likes to, um, come in field as well, uh, to, to play the, with the little triangles in midfield. But yeah, a decent young lad and a decent prospect. Uh, so yeah, it'd be interesting to see what he can do between now and then. Uh, maybe he can get an, a couple of assists uh, along the way. But um, cheers, Reese, Skyblue Fans TV. A massive thank you to Reese uh, for giving us the insight on Brook Norton Coffee there. We'll hopefully be getting plenty more upsides from uh, Sky Blue Fan TV for the rest of the season on Norton Coffee, who initially there wasn't too much hype around him actually moving to um, Coventry because 
defensively, as we talked about, as Reese mentioned, he hadn't done particularly well. However, a goal and two assists so far this season. That's across the whole campaign, I should mention. Uh, 1.38 shot creating actions, 41.2 take on percentage success, which is good. Uh, a pass uh, success rate of 62.5% could be higher. That is certainly down to the ambitious crossing that he brings into his game, which you can see here 3.35 crosses per 90 2.34 tackles per 90 1.24 blocks 1.83 clearances and 0.45 interceptions so fingers crossed the aim here is to see more defensive improvement and some better accuracy regarding um his kind of balls and crosses into the box uh, moving next to austin trusty unfortunately we don't have uh, our insight this week uh, lots of busy people are busy of course and we've got to accept that fact and uh, hopefully we'll have some more expertise on austin trusty next month but continuing four goals one assist so far this campaign 45 percent take on success 66.1 percent pass accuracy 0.56 crosses per 90 he's averaging 2.32 tackles per 90 1.71 blocks 4.24 clearances and 1.26 interceptions now charlie patino uh is unfortunately going for a little bit of a tricky period as we know last month he actually managed to get sent off for uh blackpool in a game which a lot of Blackpool fans actually started to turn on the player. You may have seen another a number of articles actually going around social media talking about Charlie Patino's and the fans a little bit uh, turning, not necessarily nasty, um, but certainly people suggesting that maybe he isn't the right player for them. Um, he was sent off in a 2-1 loss against Swansea that was really costly. The big issue that Patino is facing at the moment, however, is the fact that Mick McCarthy has come in as Blackpool's new head coach. And this is having a dramatic impact on Patino, who actually was not selected for the last two games. Uh, Blackpool have lost to Reading 3-1 and, lost to, uh, and drew against Burnley, which actually was quite a good result for Blackpool, considering where Burnley are in the table. But he's not been involved in either of the last two games. And there are concerns that minutes on the field may start to be significantly lessened uh, with Mick McCarthy now in charge. I'm hoping that's not going to be the case. I'm hoping that he can force his way back into the team. Um, but this isn't a good sign for Patino, who we know needs to play if he's got a chance of working his way into Arsenal potential selection for next season. Now, uh, let's talk about the rest and uh, finish off today's show with these players. First of all, Cedric, of course, uh, has now been able to go over and play for Fulham. He's come off the bench on a couple uh, of occasions so far this season. Only two, so I'm just going to quickly tweak that. There we go. Two assists, so uh, two appearances so far this season for Fulham. Only eight minutes played. Came on in their last game in which they lost uh, to Brentford to a late goal, um, so particularly one that people might want to look out for there. Uh, mainly, Ainsley Maitland-Niles has made 18 appearances for Southampton, continues to play, uh, even with um, the new management, managerial changes throughout the team. Hopefully, he continues to get enough minutes that there'll be a potential sale with one year left on his deal in the summer. Alex Rodderson continuing to play out in Turkey, 23 appearances, 40 goals conceded and just three uh, clean sheets so far. Uh, Pablo Marie has indeed returned now officially fully and has been for some time now since the awful attack that he experienced last year. 19 appearances now, one goal, 23 goals conceded and five clean sheets for Monza, who are doing very well. And at this rate, they are indeed going to stay up, which means that we will get that around 6 million figure for the option that will be activated should indeed Monza remain in Serie A, which they are looking like they are going to. Uh, Conquo, as we told you at the uh, the last show that we did, has moved out to Austria with Sturmgratz. He was playing in the lower leagues with Crew. He's now gone to Austria to play uh, against Champions League level teams like Red Bull Salzburg. He's made five appearances so far for Sturmgratz and done quite well. Three goals conceded, two clean sheets in those five appearances, looking quite good indeed, although I can tell you that those minutes certainly are not accurate for him, and I didn't tweak those in time. Um, Mika Bireth is uh, not necessarily, again, playing all that much uh, for Valveik. Nine appearances, two goals so far. Arsenal would hope that he'd get a few more minutes. He looks like he'll return to the under-21s in the summer. What happens with him remains uh, pretty much unknown at this stage. And Marcelo Flores continuing to play out uh, for Real Oviedo. There's hope that he might indeed sign a contract with Arsenal and then go on loan again next season. 15 appearances, one assist so far in Spain for Marcelo Flores, who the club do still rate highly and are hoping that has got a big future, but needs to get more senior level 
uh, competitive minutes on the field. And they will hope to do that again next season is what I'm hearing. Uh, Miguel Aziz not playing to that much at all for Wigan. Just the two appearances for him. 104 minutes on the field. Again, a, a player with had which had so much promise, but again, isn't necessarily... Uh, getting the opportunity for Wigan. Nikolai Mona continuing to play for Den Bosch. 16 appearances so far, three goals, one assist, and getting plenty of game time, although has suffered a bit of an injury. Same for Tyrese John Jules. Unfortunately, he has also suffered an injury, which has stopped him from playing. Tim Akinola continues to play for Chesterfield. 25 appearances, one assist, a real integral part of that team. Uh, I imagine he's not necessarily a player that's going to make it at Arsenal in the long term, but maybe one that Arsenal can make some money from on a smaller scale in the future. Omar Rekic, as we told you before, has obviously gone to Wigan uh, on loan as well from Arsenal after not doing particularly well in the Netherlands with Sparta Rotterdam. He's made two appearances and 113 minutes played as well. Alex Kirk continuing to play regularly at Air United up north. Uh, 23 appearances so far, two goals, two assists and five clean sheets, doing quite well. Uh, again, a player similar, I think, to Akinola. Whilst he won't necessarily have a future at Arsenal, I think that he'll most certainly get a permanent move somewhere else, which could get Arsenal some money. Alabiosu, 27 appearances so far for Kilmarnock, also in Scotland, 1,433 minutes played. Hasn't necessarily done enough, I think, to show that he's necessarily got a future at Arsenal, but similar, as I've said already, to some of the others, may get a permanent move and earn Arsenal a little bit of money. And the same could probably be said for Mazid Agungbo playing with Crawley. 15 goals conceded in the three clean sheets for the defender, 718 minutes played. Eja Heri, as we told you last month, has gone on loan to Finland. He's now played in four games, um, seven goals conceded, zero clean sheets. Quite the turnaround from him playing in non-league uh, in the first half of the season to go in and play in competitive level football in Finland. He has played every single game he's been involved in so far, which is great. I think maybe he was on, on the bench for the last game, um, but uh, has had a bit of a reality check. Tom Smith is not currently playing for Chelmsford. He's not played at all. He's just been on the bench for them, which Arsenal will be frustrated about. Of course, they prefer when they send their players on loan that they do the due diligence to make sure the players, or the, rather the clubs they send their players to, will make sure that they play, and that's not yet happened. He was playing at Bromley, not playing at Chelmsford. Uh, Taylor Foran has gone to Hartlepool. He started playing immediately. Six appearances, nine goals conceded, no clean sheets. Hartlepool are struggling down at the bottom of League Two. So he was always going to face uh, significant challenges playing there. But he's getting minutes, which is good for the youngster. Uh, Billy Vigar and Kido Taylor-Hart have both been playing in Derby County's under-21 side. They've got three appearances each, not yet got a goal or assist either between them. And they will probably continue to feature in the youth team if they don't do enough to impress and get on the Derby County senior side team. Not sure how Arsenal viewed that or whether or not they felt that they just needed to continue getting minutes elsewhere, even if it was at youth level because they weren't getting enough minutes in the in the uh, under-21 side of Arsenal. Bit of a strange one. But very interesting. And lastly, Nathan Butler Oyedeji is playing for Accrington Stanley and has operated four times so far for the League One club. I'm actually going to be able to watch him play this weekend because I'm going to watch Charlton play against Accrington Stanley on Saturday. So I'll be able to give you an in person roundup of how Nathan Butler Oyedeji does, if indeed he does play for Accrington Stanley on Saturday. There you go. That's all of Arsenal's loanies rounded up and given you all the information I feasibly could with some fantastic help from our experts, of course. If you have enjoyed the show, please do leave a like on the video. A lot of effort goes into putting these shows together once a month with the stats, with the experts and reaching out to people to give you the insight. So I really would appreciate a dropping a like on the video. I do feel that this is the most comprehensive roundup of our loan players across the entirety of YouTube covering Arsenal. So I hope you've enjoyed the content and I hope you've enjoyed what you've listened to. I'll see you again tomorrow morning uh, as well and uh, tune in at 8am for all the latest Arsenal news rounded up and discussed with, of course, our Q&A show. And I'd just like to end the show by saying a massive welcome back to the membership scheme for King. Uh, always great to see you part of the family, my friend, and good to see you in the chat box as well. I'll see you again soon. Have a fantastic evening. Enjoy it. And as always, up the Arsenal. 